In the early 1900s, a few of my friends suggested I go watch this kid and do an article about him. They said, DC, this kid's more animated and high strung than you are. It's impossible. He makes you look tame. And out of all the four letter words people have used to describe me, tame is not even close to one of them. Some other four letter words, but not that one. So I went and watched this guy go three games. And I stand corrected. He is. We became friends, and here we are. And here to introduce Jeff is Billy O. Come on, Billy O. All right, hopefully the microphone works this time, right, Dave? <laughs> Jeff, you sure you want me to do this? No. <laughs> Not anymore. Oh. <laughs> so when I was in the bathroom just a minute ago, somebody went running into the stall and I just heard some nervous, <laughs> uh, Jeff, that wasn't you, was it? Maybe. <laughs> well, I, I tell you what, this has been a long time coming. Here, here, right? So, you know, Jeff, when you asked me to do this, you know, without hesitation, I said, I'm honored to do this for you. You and I have been longtime friends, teammates, and one of my fiercest competitors through all these years. You've inspired me to practice so much and work harder at my game, just like you did. My first memory of Jeff was Always, all in the junior traveling leagues, right, Dennis? Oh yeah, uh, it was back in the early 80s. I think Jeff was probably 10 back then, maybe. He was probably the youngest bowler in the junior traveling league at that time, or ever. Okay, maybe you were 13, I don't know. But we were, we were unloading our bowling balls, me, Lars, Terry Riley, and uh, our click team, Val. We were unloading our bowling balls, and here comes Dennis pulling up in his car, windows down, radio blaring. What, what was the song, Dennis? Always Boston or the Cars. Dennis was out singing like crazy because he loved bowling, and the other kids, Jeff, Dave McKnight, Billy K. Billy K. Yeah, all just sitting there. Um, and so Lars and I are looking at each other, and Dennis just uh, flies open the door, and he's singing, More than a feeling. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, Dennis is a great singer. He should do karaoke nights, but... Anytime, Dennis. But yeah, Lars and I looking at each other going, Dennis, are you babysitting? What? You got all these young kids with you? And he's like, hey, it's what I got. They pay gas money. I'm good to go. Oh man, Jeff, what fun it was with you back at that age, so young. Um, we had so much fun. Jeff could, at any time, copy any professional bowler there was. You could tell him, do Marshall Holman. He'd run up on the lanes and do Marshall Holman. We'd be like, holy crap, that is awesome. It's perfect. Mark Roth running up there. But he would entertain us all. It was truly amazing. On the lanes, though, Jeff, you were a maniac. I mean, it was like, we all thought you were out of control. <laughs> yes. But the one thing we, we figured out really quick was he was there to win. He wasn't there to make friends. He wasn't there to socialize. He was there to beat you, and I admired that about you. You had that killer instinct. Did he have a slight temper? <laughs> Maybe, well, yes. But you know what? It was never towards anybody else. I've never in all his years see that temper at anybody else. It was always at himself. And he was his toughest critic. He was one of those perfectionists. I guess that's why some people didn't like him but it, it never bothered me. So Jeff asked me 
you know, when I would introduce them if, you know, if it, if it would be okay if I said some funny stories, because, man, we were, we bowled junior leagues together, we bowled adults first, regional tournaments, some majors, out on tour for a while, man, it goes on and on. So I asked him, hey, what about this story? And he's like, ooh, I don't know about that one. <laughs> So there, there's a few, and we all have fun traveling stories, right? I mean, we're, Vegas. things happen, yeah, Vegas, yeah. But before I get into one of those stories that I can tell, uh, one of Jeff's other talents is his memory, right? So I'm gonna put Jeff, here's a quiz for you. What ball or balls did you use when you made your first national finals. Oh, you're national kidding. Finals? Come on. National finals? Yeah, when you made the top 24 in Kentucky. Was that a Rhino R.E. Sky? Rhino R.E. Sky up the gutter. Yeah. Oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now here's even one even deeper. What was the serial number on that bowl? Not a clue. <laughs> Not a clue on that one. Because you know what? Jeff, Jeff's the guy that he can remember any frame or anything he's bowled. And even if you're bowling with him, he remembers what you bowled that day, what ball you used, where you stood, what you left in the fifth frame. It's crazy. But that, Jeff, that's one of your, that's one of your best talents is your memory. So, getting to the stories. <laughs> Do you remember the time you, me, and Pete Maybank, we went to the Peterson tournament, and you tried uh, some chewing tobacco for the first time? <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Kinda didn't go very well. We had to pull over after about 10 minutes. Someone, someone wasn't feeling too good. Also, too, uh, do you remember that time in Dallas? Yes, enough. We bought, <laughs> we bought the Pro-Am, yep. and he wanted to do something fun later. Yeah, we did. We, yeah, we probably shouldn't tell that one either. It was fun. And then Vegas. Oh, God. Okay, now there's, we've been to Vegas a lot. High rollers, uh, professional tournaments, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But do you remember that time in Vegas? Which one? Oh. You know. You could say it. Go ahead. Well, I probably you should. Go, no, go ahead. I probably should. Go ahead. Go ahead. Because, right? Go ahead. You're fine. No, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Come on. So you lucked out there, Jeff. Thank God. <laughs> but the one story I can tell is we all know Jeff loves to gamble, right? Oh, yeah. And then, so back in the 90s, you know, like uh, we were always traveling around, whether it be in cars, vans, or RVs, but going from stop to stop, like it's a traveling circus. It's not like how the tour is now, where they just bowl a little bit here, a little bit there. And there's a lot of downtime. So some of us like to golf but some of us like to gamble. Jeff didn't like to golf, so he found the guys that played cards, and a lot of those guys were the old veterans, like Charlie Tapp, Joe Hutchinson, and Jeff's buddy. I don't know how he ever got hooked up with him, Bobby Knipple. Does anybody remember Bobby Knipple? Yeah, Mark does, a few of you. He's one of the old, old veterans out there. And then also Don Mosier. And, uh, you know, those guys were not only professional bowlers, but professional hustlers. And Jeff didn't know that. So after about eight tournaments of Jeff losing some of his Pro-Am money, because back in the day we used to get, you know, 35, 50 bucks for bowling Pro-Ams. Jeff would always go out and gamble that, and uh, those guys would always take his money. So after about eight tournaments, Jeff's in the paddock, he's like, Billy, Billy, come here, guess what? I finally won at cards. He goes, and they won't pay me. I'm like, what do I do? So 
So I said, well, let's go talk to Bobby. So we went over and we're talking to Bobby Knipple and he's like messing with his ear and I'm like, what's going on? And he's like, I don't hear you. Well, Bobby Knipple was, if nobody knew this, he was deaf and he had a hearing aid. So he just turned it off and he kept walking away from Jeff. <laughs> and so Jeff's like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. And I go, Jeff, you better learn how to play golf. <laughs> so, but that right there is what showed me Jeff's never give up attitude. And for all that, all of you, everybody that's ever bowled with Jeff, he's never quit. He's always been out there. He's been one of the toughest competitors I know. And, you know, off the lanes, Jeff's one of the most sincere and thoughtful friends I have. And all I can say is, Jeff, it's about time. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff DeCover. I can remember going to Michigan Lanes, Mike Marks ran a, um, Mike Eaton ran a pro shop in the basement, and I used to be there quite a bit. This guy, at five and six years old, his mother dropped him off, he spent hours and hours and hours of practice. I'll never forget that. I always used to, I used to call him a little snot or a little kid or something, <laughs> and he worked his butt off to get where he's at today. So I needed to come up and say something about that. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> it is an honor and a privilege to be inducted today in the Grand Rapids Bowling Hall of Fame. I'd be very fortunate and grateful to be sitting here today. I'm fortunate my son Parker is healthy, happy, and on his way to doing phenomenal things. The great people I've met in my bowling career, and fortunate for everything. Are you ready? <laughs> Summertime, 1977. I was driven to Michigan Lanes. I bowled on lane 32. My games were 28. 19 and 37. Talk about remembering things, by the way. 45 years later. Bam. <laughs> I am proud to say I grew up at Michigan Lanes. You talk about a cast of characters. Rob Velo, Mary Slinker, Dan Bagley, Clarence Marvin. <laughs> Margie Brown, Ray Corin, Frankie Foro. It's also where I met some great people. Oh my God. Terry Ramey, Eddie Ladwig, Dennis Johnson. <laughs> people who owned the pro shop at the time. Carrie Parcells. The first person who owned that pro shop, by the way, was Mike Eaton Sr. Before he went to Kevin Bowling Center. I bowled league at Michigan Lanes from start to finish, but Sunday mornings, oh, Sunday mornings were the best time. You show up in the morning, you bowl three, four games, then it was time to help. You spray those house shoes, those nasty house shoes. Use that carpet sweeper thing to get the popcorn off the carpet, push that uh, trash can across, get the ashtrays, clean and all the nasty crap. That's why I probably don't smoke, thank God. Um, uh, rip the, the telescores, rip those, you know, those telescores off and everything, and sharpen the pencils. But the one major thing that I had to do was I had to make sure I get to Mr. Fables before breakfast shut down so Clarence and Rob could eat. So, um, I had to make, make sure I did that, um, kept score, 
did everything there, and it was so much part of my life, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, Michigan Lanes watched out for me. They did not take care of me. They didn't. No, oh, they made sure. Oh, yeah. Because there's one story about me uh, getting on a line one day. And uh, see, Dennis is going to laugh his butt off about a lot of stuff I'm going to say about Michigan Lanes. But I got on a line one day so much that they shoved me on a shelf on the top of the video game room because I was getting on a line so much one day. And I learned two things that day. One, I'm afraid of heights. And number two, I ain't getting on a line here ever again. So, oh yeah. <laughs> so, I went from bowling Saturday morning leagues to coming home. I had masking tape in the living room and I made a bowling lane out of it. And my dad, who had bowled at Miracle Lanes, had these little pins and he, luckily he won 10 of them. And he, I set those up while the three o'clock ABC telecast was going on. And I would bowl, I'd grab any round thing I could grab, upset my dad every time he was sitting on the couch while the TV was on. And uh, I would bowl and emulate the pros that were bowling at three o'clock. So then I went from bowling nine o'clock league in Michigan. And some of you guys remember this, 11.30 a miracle, three o'clock traveling. And that's the way a lot of people were doing their uh, schedules. I was fortunate enough to run the traveling league for a couple of years, uh, getting to know some of the bowling centers. I uh, went to the centers, we set up the schedules, and did a lot of the secretary work. Um, one of the first tournament experiences I ever had was at Michigan Lanes um, when there was a tournament organization called the YTDA that was out of Indiana that came up and bowled. And uh, I got a lot of tournament experience bowling those. And then, um, Tony Buck's gonna remember this one. Tony got a letter one day from an organization that started up. And that organization was meant for the better bowlers to come out and try to get better and we're gonna do this in a PBA regional format. We're gonna have two days. We're gonna have an eight game qualifier on Saturday and the people that made the cup, we're gonna bowl Sunday. Bowl 12 games around rubber and match play, top high bowl set winner. Tony, Mike Smith, and myself, we drove in your dad's van up to Central Michigan University in bowl. Mike and I got fortunate enough to make the finals. The tournament organization is the MJMA and it's here today. And the vision of Dan Ottman, and I cannot thank Dan Ottman enough for running the organization that made me a better bowler, made a lot of people that are younger than me better. And thank you to Dan Ottman for that. Um, so when I bowled my first one, I came home and I said, I need to start bowling these a lot more and my parents didn't have a whole lot of money. And they said, you need to choose. And I said, MJ May, in a heartbeat. And uh, problem was, if you made the finals, you had to bowl two days, which meant hotel rooms, wasn't able to go right away. When I was able to go, I went to Bay City, and the, uh, it was April 1987, and made the step ladder. Stayed in a $30 hotel. I stayed in a lot of $30 hotels, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, made the finals there, to, made the step ladder, and then I, it was just pretty much off to the races after that. Um, my senior year, excuse me, my junior year of high school was the last year of both juniors. And um, one of the things that I did was I hooked up with guys like Billy, Mike, Dennis, and I went to watch bowling leagues to, because I had a feeling that I might be going to the adult leagues a little um, sooner than I should, but I uh, wanted to bowl with them because they were better. And uh, um, my last year of adult leagues, I averaged 207 in Michigan. I was the only guy to average 200. 
I was the third highest average at Michigan. Here's another stat, Billy. I was the third highest average in the house behind Jim Ebenstein and Dave Halleck, of all things. Yes, I do remember things. So I bowled um, in May of 88, my last MJMA, I made the championship match and I lost to a guy by the name of Kurt Pilon, if you ever heard of Kurt. Um, he's done a couple things afterwards. So I, I made his career. <laughs> so, um, I was a senior in high school when I started bowling adult leagues. Um, some of you guys know that. Um, I bowled three nights a week. I went to Grand Rapids Central High School. I worked a couple nights a week where I didn't work. Um, that's where I got to bowl with people like Billy O, with people like George Miller, Mike Smith. Um, I met guys. I met, I met so many great people. Um, one of them was Tom Van Zorn. Remember Tom Van Zorn, everybody? He grabbed me one night at Eastbrook and he said, you're going to bowl with me in city tournament. We're going to bowl nationals together. I'm like, okay. Two years later, we won the city doubles. I met great people like Todd Krudolf. Everybody remember Todd? Todd and his father, Ted. Todd and I have an um, interesting relationship as far as him kicking my butt every time I bowled him. The Fairlands Invitational. Final four is... Me and George, Todd and Billy. George shoots 300 at me. <laughs> I still beat him. <laughs> Billy lost to Todd. We have a two game match. We tie for the first time ever. Don the winner, don't know what to do. It was a one game match. I should have just pulled one frame. I lost. <laughs> I have a lot of second place finishes, by the way, in life, and that's where I'm going to get to Eddie Ladwig on his uh, course tournaments. Um, so let's just get to this story real quick about um, <laughs> my first number 300 game. It's in the dock, by the way, but I'm just going to say it. I shot 300 February 27, 1980. <laughs> okay, I know dates. Okay, I do. I do. Black you dot. Um, you want to know a line I played to? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> close, thank God. Um, probably something pink. Um, so I shoot 300, fortunately, 39 or 40. We bowl pot games afterwards. I remember I'm a senior in high school, by the way, so I got to go to school the next day. And um, we stayed out till about 2, 2.30 in the morning. I go to bed, and I already know I'm not going to bowl on the following day because Michigan Lanes, Mike Smith, you remember this conversation, you know, the six, the, the strike and row jackpot in Michigan on Wednesday morning, that's really. Well, I had winter break, went there and bowled, was in it. And I knew that it wasn't broke. So the following day, after the 300, I go try to find a sub spot, find a sub spot. Second game, nobody has six strikes in a row, which it was down to. I had the first five, and this is the first time in my entire life I heard cat calls in my backswing. Struck, upset pretty much everybody in the building. They paid me in quarters. <laughs> Hundred and fifty dollars a quarter. About the third game, about halfway in. Does anybody remember who Leroy McIntosh is and what he did for a living? He was a Kent County Sheriff. You. Come here. Why are you here? No, why are you here? Shouldn't you be in school? Yes. <laughs> you know you're being true right now. Yes. <laughs> um, 
but my mom called me in sick. <laughs> Are you sick? No. So he says, I don't want to see you here until if you have break. Okay. I have the fear of death in me now, thank you very much. So I went to Sagebrush, bought a couple of pair of whitewashed jeans, a couple of shirts, and enjoyed my happy afternoon, go back to school the following day, where the announcements go off. I'm in my chair, and not 30 seconds after your announcements go off, is Jeff D. Cover in the uh, class today? Yeah. Send him to the office. I took the long way to the office, by the way. I walked every single step that Grand Rapids Central High School had in order for me to not go to the office. There's Mrs. Margulis, Mr. Joseph, and there's Death Row sitting over here. I don't know what the world they did. First, congratulations on your 300 game you had at Kilwood Bowling Center on Tuesday night. Oh, cool, thanks. By the way, congratulations on the money you won at Michigan Lanes on Wednesday morning. You cannot participate in high school sports anymore. Um, I've been bowling with Dolling since July of last year. I don't, I'm not interested in um, competing in high school sports. Well, you know you have an unexcused absence. Okay. That's all I could say was okay. Oh, are you getting cocky with it? No, no, I, I'm just saying. Um, I straightened up after that. Kind of like what I did at Michigan Lakes, I straightened up after that. Um, one regret that I do kind of have, I don't really have a whole lot of regrets in life, but one is I never shot a sanctioned 300 at Michigan Lakes. I do have 300 at Michigan during the, if, if anybody's gone to high school, haven't they had these weird classes like, um, the easiest classes you could ever take, like cooking or whatever. Mine was lifetime sports, and lifetime sports had bowling in it, so of course I jumped on that one. <laughs> and <laughs> I, we, were at, we went to Michigan Lanes, and we bowled out one lane, and I shot 300 during the lifetime sports class, and my phys ed teacher got to brag about that every single time that they showed up at Michigan Lanes that he, I shot a 300 game. But one of the best parts is, as far as high school goes, every, Greg Larabell, everybody remember Greg Larabell, right? Okay. Greg was the association secretary at the time. I shot 300 and he says, oh, it'd be a great idea if we took that, your, your 300 ring and we gave it to, the, to you during the uh, sports award ceremonies. Okay. So we go up first and Greg hands me this ring, look at everybody around, Takes a ring. Hey, congratulations, 300 game. Come to find out we ruined the awards ceremony because everybody else was getting these certificates and these letters and everything, and they come up to me the following day going, oh my God, that ring is real. This ring. Okay, they don't realize, by the way, that you get a cubic zirconia ring with a fake diamond and everything else in it and everything. So they think this ring is real, and they want to know where it's at. Well, it's home, because they're definitely not wearing it to Central. <laughs> not a chance, so. Another, man, I, I, don't, I don't want to tell this story. Too bad. Do it. Can anybody say they had a tree fall in their car at Sparta Lanes? <laughs> Year. I don't know the year. And this is okay, I'll give you one I don't know. What's the year? 98 or 99? What year was it, Stevie? <laughs> We're bowling city tournament at Sparta Lanes. The power went out in the city. You know, the city is like pretty much everybody that's named Austin or uh, uh, <laughs> Slaughter. Um, so they had a storm. Power's out, we're supposed to go city tournament. We go there and we're doing the tribe reschedule. So I had rode in John Slot's truck to a house and played 
poker. Thanks for bringing up the gambling, by the way. So I get a phone call about a half an hour in, and see the Austin. I swear to God, I swear to God, I swear to God, I swear to God, I swear to God. What? I swear to God, I swear to God. What? A tree fell on your car. Bull crap. <laughs> he said, we can't believe it either. Tree fell. By the way, it never damaged any other car. I'm parked here, and there's five cars around here, and not one scratch on the other five cars. It was only on my car. And according to what I heard, because I didn't see it, so we come back to the bowl, and they got my car pulled to the side of the building. When I walked into Sparta, by the way, it's pretty much quiet as it is in here right now. <laughs> um, the funny things of, we did pull the second squad. Mike Avery came, ripped the CD player out of my car. By the way, Parker, a CD. Is this little disc that we used to play video, play music on, you know. So, just want to make sure you do that. And then, Billy O takes me home, because he pulled that second squad. I remember things. <laughs> so here's where I got to read. No, I don't need my glass. I've been very fortunate enough to win some very big tournaments around. I have a Michigan Majors title, which I'm very proud of. I have um, a Northern Michigan Majors title that was a championship, um, support panel link condition. I have uh, Lakeshore singles titles. Um, and I'm proud of a lot of the, you know, I have city tournament titles, state title, everything. Um, one thing I bowled six times on television. Um, Eddie Ladwig, bless his heart, got the WXMI and the Fox crew to uh, televise the final matches for the, uh, for the Coors Tournament. I'll always be grateful for that. Nice exposure. I have seven if you count the Peterson video. <laughs> oh yeah. But I have eight if you count the documentary my son did. And I'm so proud of the uh, documentary that he did on um, Which brings me to my son. Um, I do not know. I do not know where I would be without him. Um, he's been on the right path since day one. He's been very successful. He has done so much in such little time. His work ethic is second to none. He is building professional relationships and he's on the right path to success. And I cannot be more proud to be his dad. Um, Parker's mom is here. We don't have names anymore, by the way. It's Parker's mom, Parker's dad. Um, I wanted her here as much as she wanted to be. Some people don't know that Parker was a twin. We, um, unfortunately, we lost Parker's brother Mason when he was five days old. Um, October 22nd, 2002 was when they were born. Um, Mason was doing very well when they were born and then they were two pounds apiece, and then Parker wasn't doing very well, and then a couple of days later we found out that uh, Mason wasn't born with an enzyme in his body that broke anything down. So um, unfortunately we found out the terrible news that he was not gonna make it. Um, October 27th, he passed away. An hour later, Natasha got to hold Parker for the very first time. They made it work. Um, the people at Neo Natal at Spectrum, bless their hearts. Getting to touch Parker for the first time was an incredible feeling. So from start to finish, 59 days later, from October 22nd, we got Parker home December 19th of 2002. It's the best, <laughs> the best present you can ever give. Um, 
Natasha, I appreciate your respect to you. Thank you for Thank you. <laughs> I've been very fortunate in my bowling career. Um, 22 different bowling centers I have 300 at sanction. I'm proud that I broke the city record with one of my great friends in Mike Smith. We have 1,600 together, which was held up for a very, very long time. Um, I bowled with some of the best bowlers in this city, the state, the country. I'm, I'm just over, over, over fortunate. I can't, I can't say the word fortunate enough because um, I've been, I've been able to just. The sport of bowling has given me so much. I don't know where I would be without it. But one other thing that you do is you give back. You try to do whatever you can to give back. And one of the things that I tried to do was um, to run turns back. Um, uh, I learned so much from running tournaments from people like Mr. Ken Charette, from the Michigan Majors, from um, the PBA, the mini matches in Lansing, the Lakeshore Singles, the Northern Michigan Majors. I've learned so much. Um, but what I'm very proud of is I get to watch bowlers do well. I get to watch bowlers pad their resumes. I get to watch honor scores being shot. I get to watch People shoot their first ever 300 game, first ever 700 series, first ever 800 series. Come up afterwards and say, man, great tournament, great everything. Hopefully you'll be back next year. Um, and, it, and it's an incredible honor. Getting asked to run the Masters tournaments at Queen's tournaments, Senior Masters, it, it's a great honor. And I, I'm very fortunate for that. And <laughs> This is gonna bring me to Mike Eaton Sr., which I, I missed him this year, I really did. Mike, back in 2008, gave me an opportunity to run the New Year's Eve tournament here. And uh, I, I told him what I wanted to do, I wanted to run a handicap tournament, I wanted to run an Asheville tournament. 15 years later, we sell the house out every single year with a wait list, every single year. And then we run these quad tournaments the following week. Um, and it's because of Mike Eaton Sr. that we're able to do this. And I'm so grateful and thankful for him. He is such a he was such a friend. He was he always helped me out. He helped me so much. He gave me the conversations we had, everything that we did was incredible. And I, I sincerely missed him this year. And thank you to Mike Eaton Sr. Now we get to thank people directly, and if seriously I don't get to you, it's not because of anything. I spent a few minutes up here and I'm thirsty. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, specific people I wanted to thank today. Um, what, Warren Moody was um, an, a gentleman who um, was my sponsor the first few years when I did the PBA tour. and. Uh, I can't thank him enough for the opportunity. That, that's a once in a lifetime opportunity, so thank you to Warren Moody for that. Um, another person I need to thank is Gary Dyer. Gary, uh, Gary put me in a lot of tournaments. Gary uh, gave me uh, opportunities I wouldn't have had. Gave me a job a couple of times when I needed it. You know, sometimes you know, he helped me out, his friendship. I cannot thank Gary Dyer. <laughs> I wish he was here today. Mike Smith. I love you, buddy. 40 years. One story I will tell real quick is your first 300 game also. <laughs> I believe the day, Billy, was February 7 of 89, East Brook Lanes. You shot 300. And I'm sitting there worried about you because I thought you celebrated too much. And we're driving home on the belt line and I'm following you home. And you go home and you went and you're, you're like to your dad, uh, dad, where are you going? Um, 
Well, I think your sister's in a ditch and around the belt line. Oh, Jeff's car's there too, by the way, about a mile down the road. Yeah, I ended in a ditch following him on the way home and I'm 17. <laughs> so, I've, I've traveled with Mike to tournaments before and um, Mike is one of the greatest people I've ever met in my entire life. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you, sir. Dennis Johnson, 40-year friend, Michigan Lanes. From taking me to Michigan Lanes, taking me to the Click, Traveling League, ruining the band Boston for me since your cassette tapes were just playing it over and over and over and over again. Like Mike Smith did with White Snake, by the way. I didn't want to bring that up. Yeah, I had to. Uh, the conversation we've had the friendship. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate you very much. George Miller. George, I friended him a very, very um, long time ago, 40 years. He, he was one of the guys that took me with him to tournaments to watch, to um, learn um, the conversations we've had, a bully with him, tournaments with him. Um, George Miller is a great friend and uh, I appreciate him very much. Lars Ferkstis, who is here today. Um, I got to know Lars at the very beginning. Um, he, him and I both won uh, state average titles. And uh, I got to know him from the traveling league. And then uh, we were pretty much in business together for a while and everything. And I'm so thankful to you and your friendship. And I appreciate you very much, sir. Um, I have some out-of-town friends, obviously, not here today. Ed Rondo, Steve Marakic, Ken Wyatt, that um, um, I've been friended for years. And a lot of the people from the PBA Regionals and the Michigan Majors, I can't thank them enough for, uh, for welcoming me into their little cliques and their little uh, circles and everything. And I thank them very much. So now I get to talk about Billy. Yeah, you better run. Um, from hanging out with Billy in the pits of Click Lanes to riding with him in tournaments in that red Escort GT that he had. Luckily, by the way, he had multiple cassette tapes instead of having certain ones. So we actually got to listen to a variety of music at the time. The multiple conversations we've had about pretty much everything. You, you don't want to ring Dallas up right now? Ring Dallas up. He watched me get whipped in a dungeon in Dallas, by the way. <laughs> Bowling with and against him. I was so excited when Billy made the show in California. He put Grand Office Bowling on the map, ladies and gentlemen. He, um, he showed me how to do laundry, by the way, when we were on tour, too. Don't think I didn't forget about that, either. Only he showed me how to do laundry, because I didn't know Jack. I am, uh, I am so happy that he has a career where he is today with Brunswick. He has had the best career of any male bowler in the city of Grand Rapids, Barna. I appreciate everything he has done. I appreciate everything he's done for me. I appreciate everything he's done for Parker. He has invited me to his home for Christmas dinner. He has invited me to his home for parties, and I cannot, I cannot thank you. I cannot thank you enough. Thank you. Um, there's a lot more people I need to thank. I am going to be fist bumping, hugging, <laughs> handshaking, everything for the next months. Um, I thank everyone who is in here today. Congratulations to Sarah, Robin, and Mike for being here too. I, I can't be in a better class. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. Jeff, on behalf of the Michigan State USBC, I want to congratulate you on your induction today.
Here's a certificate from the Michigan State USBC, and we also have a gift to you for you. Once again, congratulations. I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. What a great afternoon. I always end up with my three favorite words to end the evening, to the bar. <laughs> <laughs>